Thank you very much, Tom. I, I want to thank you and Marie for inviting me. It's been a very interesting experience. And um, when I first got the invitation, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to say about creativity? Um, I'm going I'm to approach it from a managerial point of view about managing it, thinking about what we can, you know, what, what it's for, what we can use it for in effect. And I, I wrote down, okay, what would I advise managers? And I, I wrote down a couple of things. I said, well, creativity is a good thing, I think, and we should encourage it. Kind of started off from those two premises. And then, I, then after I, I scribbled those on the piece of paper, I looked at it and I said, well, how do I know this? Wh why do I really think this? And in fact, it turns out that in the digital space, creativity is not necessarily always such a good thing. We have seen a lot of activities, piracy, defacing, and things like that. And in fact, to the extent that these things are negative, I think we can be quite confident that they will afflict firms in the future. Um, th there'll be more and more uh, possibilities for this. This is a 3D printer, which some of you might recognize. And so just as people in the past have been able to download movies and upload movies, um, for example, the uh, United, the famous United Breaks Guitar movies that that uh, caused wreaked havoc on for United Airlines. Well, they're next going to be able to scan toys made by Hasbro, perhaps, and then upload a file of the scanned image, and other consumers can then download it and maybe possibly tweak that image. But in effect, they're stealing from a certain point of view Hasbro's intellectual property. So from the point of view of Hasbro, I think we'd have to say it's a net minus, possibly. They ha they're going to have to deal with creativity at a completely different level with completely different motivations than a company like MakerBot, who makes this, who clearly are going to benefit from the whole thing. And I might suggest that there will be new players that will enter the field that we might call platform managers, just like now we have YouTube where we can upload and download videos. Perhaps there'll be a 3D tube or some, something like that that will, that will reap some benefits as well. So um, two pluses and one minuses, one minus. So I'm going to talk about the managing the platform from two different points of view. I'm going to talk about the, the platform itself and the network context of it. And for network context, if you want, you could sort of substitute the word social context, which would work a, a fair amount. This is kind of just the way I'm thinking about it. I figured there'd be a lot of people talking about this stuff here and that I could, I could avoid that and skip that part and talk about some of the other things. So I'm going to talk about the way that we can enhance this creative process or perhaps not if we want, and, and uh, the effect of the platform itself, and then the network context, that'll be the second part of the discussion. So let me start off with platform management. First of all, a platform is a very odd kind of product to manage. Um, I think that more and more companies, although they haven't realized it yet, are going to be in the platform business. We sort of think we're managing products, but we really are going to be managing platforms more and more. I use as an example of this thread list, which is a fairly simple but clear example of the platform concept. In effect, they have a little space. People upload designs. Consumers upload designs for clothing. Other consumers vote on those designs. The winning design gets produced the next week. So that is prototypical, I think, in a lot of ways of the ways in which consumer creativity is flowing into the economy now, in, 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 such that it wasn't before. Platform management is a different kind of creature. You're basically managing pixels in front of people's eyes. It's a battle of pixels. You got, you know, on the average screen, something like this, a thousand by a thousand. You're going to have to use those absolutely. The, you can't waste a single one of them. Also, the ongoing platform management is, uh, is about governance. It's about reputation management. There's topics here that are really quite different from managing either a tangible good or an intangible service. It's a unique kind of service, I would say. Um, so I'm making this, this um, claim that it's really atypical. If I look at services, a classic service like a haircut, we all say, oh yes, the consumer co-creates value. But I think that the proportion of value co-created by the consumer in a haircut, while non-trivial, while quite significant, pales in comparison to the amount of value contributed by a consumer on a typical digital platform. Facebook, all it is, is you and I talking and uploading stuff. 
The rest of the, the few thousand employees that Facebook has are just making sure the platform doesn't crash and doing a few other tasks. So we're supplying 99% of the value. So that's also a different creature than a haircut or a hotel or any of the other services that we're used to managing. Another funny thing about it is that when we talk about user-generated content in general, whether it's creative or not, the distributions don't look anything like what we see in the offline world. We're, look, we're typically looking at bell-shaped curves, Gaussian things. Instead, in the digital space where there's no constraints, the costs are low, you see these weird things called power distributions. And you'll notice we have log scales here and we have log scales there. And so you simultaneously have a very small proportion of people who are doing most of the output. And I would suggest this is a clearly applicable in the creative process, although depending on how we define creativity, but I think for the type of creativity that firms are hoping to encourage, it's going to be a small group of people who are exhibiting it. On the other hand, there's also, so there's kind of some creative superstars, but on the other hand, there's this long tail of people who every once in a while might do something kind of interesting. And uh, by the way, the power distribution, I happen to be reading uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee's book, the second machine age on the plane, and they talk about this. They have a whole chapter on this. It's kind of an interesting little subtopic in and of itself. Clearly, some of our statistical models are going to have to be revised. Um, I also might want to point out that the HCI literature, which is the human computer interface literature in computer science departments or maybe in MIS departments, has a lot to say about encouraging creativity of employees and how you produce tools that do that. And I'm, I'm not going to read through these at all, but I will point out that all the uh, sites that I have in any slide will appear on the last slide, so you can, you can wait, wait till that one and if you're interested in some of those. Um, this is a slide that has to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Al mentioned uh, open source, which is a wonderful mm, font of information that's been long studied about consumer creativity. It's obviously in the technical realm. I will admit this is slightly disingenuous in the sense that um, some, of the, some of the exemplars on this axis here have a lot of corporate uh, weight and money behind them. But on the other hand, an example like Apache, which is the dominant web server that's extant in, 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 the, in the plumbing of the, of the World Wide Web, is basically a bunch of people who do it uh, because they're interested in it, because they're creative and they're expressing their creativity with digital co with coding. Um, it's also an oddity in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm sure most of you know transaction cost analysis, which is the I don't know. I, I mean, it's a Nobel Prize winning idea of Williamson's that talks about why companies are what they are, why they're not bigger, why they're not smaller. And in effect, in the theory of transaction cost analysis, there's exactly two ways to organize work. There's a hierarchy, in which case the boss picks up the phone and says, do this. And there's a market, in which case price is the allocation mechanism that determines who does what and when they do it. Open source doesn't fit in the category. It's just this new thing that's just parachuted into the economy that we haven't really grasped, I, don't, I think it's fair to say. Um, let me switch and talk about the network context of things. Um, I'm using network in a fairly technical sense, not a, you know, in, in a very, well, in almost kind of an MIS sense. So, so let, me, let me talk about three different categories of network that I think set different contexts for how we manage the creative process and that have to be taken into account kind of as moderators of what we're supposed to do. So a peer network, I have some examples in here that I'm afraid are a little bit vague. I'll try to be slightly more concrete about this when I talk about the different kinds of networks. Um, a, a peer network, a hierarchy type of thing that we're, we might be used to from advertising. We might employ creativity and consumer creativity there. A two-sided network, and I'll try to try to make the distinction between a peer and a two-sided network clear. Um, a peer network, perhaps you have multiple roles. Let me use WhatsApp as my example. Some of the time you're you're sending an SMS. Some of the time you're receiving an SMS, and you're pretty much indifferent 
as to how you get charged. If, if, the, if WhatsApp decided to charge you for sending the SMS, you'd be, oh, okay, that's how I'm going to pay. If they switch to, oh, you're going to pay instead for receiving it, you really wouldn't care. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, Wa George Washington Bridge, which you only pay the toll coming into New York City. But because it's a because it's a situation that's basically symmetric, you don't, it doesn't really bother you. It's not like all oh, these other guys are paying and I'm getting away for free because I only drive outbound, see? So it doesn't really matter. So a peer network, you, um, with, with a, with a, um, with a, with a, uh, a two-sided network, on the other hand, you don't internalize the costs and benefits of the other side a little bit. So th that's the distinction. Um, Networks, of course, are characterized by externalities, and externalities are dev devilishly difficult to manage. They produce a situation in which, as the, as the network gets bigger, it becomes more valuable because more the other people are adding value to it. And, of course, when a network becomes more valuable, it draws in more people, thus creating this kind of virtuous cycle. So pricing, managing the process, you've got chicken and egg problems. It's, it's, it's quite a bit different than other kinds of startup activities, and, and uh, it's different than in maintenance activities. Let me talk a little bit about the two-sided example. Um, in two-sided examples, I'm going to suggest perhaps in some, at least some creative platforms, there might be two kinds of people that don't externalize each other's costs and benefits particularly. We might have pr producers and we might have consumers. And so the producers, as they produce content, that brings in more consumers. And as the consumers become a bigger audience, that brings in more producers. So you do have a externality that's operating, although it cuts both ways. It might be the case that you would like the other side to be relatively large, but your side to be relatively small. So the externalities will depend on how, who's ex who, who we're looking at at the moment. Um, so let's see. Um, I want to talk a little bit, just as a two examples, one example of pricing when you have sightedness in a market. So imagine that you have two groups. You have a creative side and you have the audience side of my market. Now the classic economics would be I've got a demand curve here, got price and quantity demand. I'm going to move my finger along this curve until I hit a spot where the rectangle is as big as possible because the rectangle is my revenue. It's the price times the demand. Then I might say, oh, that looks pretty good over here. I'm going to go over to this side, and I'm going to figure out my best price for these people. But that would be a very bad strategy because it might be that what you could do is if you take the audience side and you drop the price from P1 to P2, you lose big in terms of the revenue coming in on the audience side. So this part goes, you pick up a little bit here, but it's really not much. But what happens is suddenly these people are much happier. You shift their demand curve and you come out ahead overall. So when you have two groups of people with different psychologies, managing the process becomes quite a bit more complicated. And this is also applicable for kind of a qualitative design issue, like what color should my platform be? Should it be green or orange? And of course, the creatives, they love the green platform, but the audience really likes the orange platform. So how do I manage to make both people happy, and how do I do this? And you have kind of some really nasty non-recursion going on in your design process. So pretty tricky. Um, the final thing I'd like to talk about, and I think it's just going to work out hopefully just about right, is a broadcast type network. Maybe we're going to have people help us design our advertisements. And this picture shows the Doritos commercial that was broadcast in the U.S. on the Super Bowl, which was designed by consumers. Mostly what I want to talk about here from a managerial point of view is what this does into our internal logic and organization of a firm. So here's the way corporations used to look like when I was young, you know, in the industrial age. Um, it was the, the pre-age, we had punch cards. I don't even want to tell you what, what was going on back then. But then at, so at some point we put PCs on people's desks and the corporations flattened out. They got hollow, right? Then a little bit later, then we connected all of those PCs, and we have this kind of spaghetti thing where anybody can send email to anybody. So how we manage the marketing function within the firm becomes more of a network phenomenon within the firm. 
now we sort of fast forward to the present day, and I'm going to present the boundary of the firm as this kind of solid, thick line here. On the other hand, what's really happening when we allow the consumer to do our ads for us, to do our new product design, to do our branding, is it changes how we have to think about things, and the, permeab the, the firm becomes much more permeable. And I think managing that process, who are these people? Are they employees? Are they consumers? And so forth is especially difficult. There's a variety of tasks that are being outsourced to customers that require maybe modest amounts of creativity, and I think we might agree that new product innovation and developing requires a little bit more creativity. And we're going to have to figure out how to live inside the firm and outside the firm with that. And with that, I conclude. So we have our traditional few minutes for some questions in that case. Anybody have a, have a question about any of this? Please. You know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but I would say that people have it, it's very implicit. Sometimes I hear people talk about Facebook and complaining about it. You know, they've changed the design or they're stealing my information. And I think the consumer is still trying to figure out the, what the gives and the gets are on this platform. And it's still, it's a budding topic. I think people are aware, the consumer is aware of externalities, but I don't really, it's interesting on the economic side of, of marketing, we see a lot of papers about externalities, but we don't really see much on the CB side of how consumers perceive the groupness and how other people are helping to add value. Or maybe I, it's probably something that I might have missed. But, but anyway, that would be my stab at the question. I see a hand over here. Hey. Uh -huh. So like this hybrid that you get yeah. between marketing and higher ideas, uh -huh. you got all the hybrids you could get out of plan, I guess. Uh -huh. The planning, I think, yeah. is more like a community perspective, really, uh -huh. how to take control online, or yeah. you're wondering whether you think that could be an interesting way to move towards the existence of control in the structure. I think it's actually a n very nice metaphor. I, I like the terminology. It it's instantly reminds me of the Linux project, where there's a, a clear head of clan. I'm forgetting his name, Torvus. Uh, Linold, I think his name is. Anyway, so so it seems like a, a possibly very useful useful metaphor for describing this third way. I like it. I like it. Hi, Julian. Um, it's more a comment, but when you were talking about this, you know, blurred um, limits between the firm and the, and the consumers, and you were wondering who are these people? Are they are they consumers? Are they uh, employees? I think there is a, a firm that I is starting to understand this quite well, it's uh, um, YouTube. Uh -huh. Basically, you have first people who are uh, consumers, they use this platform to, to make videos, and they put these videos uh, online, and if they are very, very uh, successful, they, are, they, are, they, they have their channels, and if they do like more than one, one million of views per, per video, uh, uh, YouTube people contact them, ask them to come in their, uh, maybe, com maybe not come in their, in their, in their uh, Headquarter, but for, uh -huh. for, for some of them, like if they do like 10 million, they, they are invited to come and then they will, uh, YouTube is uh, discussing with them the strategy they will have, you know, to make the more views, etc. Mm -hmm. And how they can ha receive the revenues from the advertisement, etc. So basically, uh, YouTube is organizing a way so that these consumers, uh, people who uh, originally are uh, uh, consumers, can uh, own their own life mm -hmm. by doing this kind of mm -hmm. uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And these consumers become not really employees, but people who can uh, you know, earn money during this consumption uh, action, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they, they, are, they are really trying to, to, to think about this. Uh, it's I, I don't know what the word could be, consumers or uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, um, 
afraid, but I think we have to invite the world for these people. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're citing a born digital company that's figuring out how to do it. I think legacy companies <coughs> have a very difficult time making this transition. They don't have the skill sets, they don't have the capabilities to, to think in these ways. So I think that's not a coincidence. I'm, I'm not sure I would agree, because hopefully we'll make the case in not the next presentation, but the one after, that Lego, for instance, uh -huh. has a yeah. platform. Uh -huh. Certainly they've run, you know, I mean they've become the new uh -huh. That's a great counterexample. They seem to have prospered and, and turned their company into, in effect, an IT company. And that's, that's, that's pretty unusual, I think. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about the, the costs and the complexities that are attributed to software? The costs and complexities? Uh-huh. I think the, well, you know, the, um, the, the, the big brands, the names that we all know, the, the state of the art is they have something that resembles a room that looks like this with 50 screens on it. They have, I, I think of it as a war room, which is probably an awful metaphor, but they have people constantly monitoring and watching and, you know, listening and trying to engage and trying to uh, shift the, you know, if, if a conversation bubbles up, they're trying to, uh, my friend Torsten hennig Throw uses a pinball metaphor. There's a ball bouncing around there and you're kind of, companies, a lot of the bounces you don't control, but maybe once in a while you get a flipper in there and you have some money so you can get a good flip going. So th these companies are um, um, beginning to understand that marketing is 24-7 now, just, just as one example. And that's, it's costly from, a, from the point of view of corporate culture. It's a, it's a different worldview. <coughs> And it, but and presumably also in, in monitoring and, and participating and encouraging engagement. It's, it's costly. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you very much. Thanks, Tom.